welcome to Michigan's World War I Centennial News Report. I'm Dennis Skupinski. Tonight's report is entitled Henry Ford and the Great Peace Ship. We're going to learn of Henry Ford's efforts to end the First World War. Then we're going to get an update on the state's World War I Centennial activity. Then we're going to go to Australia and find out what Australia is doing for World War I Centennial with a report from Prime Minister Julia Gillard. Finally, we're going to take a look on the web and find out what is going on with Michigan's World War I Centennial on the Internet. Michigan's World War I Centennial Update, July 2012. At the present time, Michigan does not have a World War I Centennial Committee or Commission. This means that there is no overall planning or organization committee for Michigan's World War I Centennial, but there are a number of decentralized grassroots organizations that are starting to work on Michigan's World War I Centennial. The American Legion is involved and also the Veterans of Foreign War. I regret to say that Michigan's National Guard is not involved at this time. If you are a National Guard member and you'd like to be involved, please contact me. My email will be shown below. Another organization, the Great War Historical Association, plans to be active with Michigan's World War I Centennial. If you belong to a club or an organization and would like to be involved, please email me and let me know what you're interested in. I can also give you some ideas. Next, we're going to go to Australia with Prime Minister Julia Gillard. She's going to let us know what Australia is doing for World War I Centennial. Gillard is on her way to Turkey to mark her first Anzac Day at Gallipoli. Before starting the journey, she pledged $83 million to mark the centenary of World War I in 2015. It will be used for education purposes and for refurbishment of our war graves around the world. The money will also go towards staging Anzac events across local communities and around the world. Ms. Gillard is the first Prime Minister since John Howard in 2005 to visit Anzac Cove. Henry Ford and the Great Peace Ship. It was December 1915. Henry Ford, the man who put America on wheels, brought the eight-hour workday, paid a salary of $5 a day to laborers, thought he could end the war by Christmas. On December 4, 1915, on board the Oscar II, 60 odd delegates, three newsreelmen, 34 newsmen, and Ford's personal staff of 20 set sail for Europe, hoping to get the boys out of the trenches and end a war by Christmas. Henry Ford's closest friend, Thomas Edison, declined to go on the trip with him. There were also a number of other prominent people who declined Mr. Ford's invitation. But on December 4th, the Oscar II left the harbor of New York. It was going to sail through the submarine-infested waters of the North Atlantic over to Europe to broadcast the message of peace on the world's longest gun, as Mr. Ford said, the Marconi, which is a reference to his ship's radio. Mr. Ford had hoped that this would be the official delegation from the United States trying to end the war in Europe, but President Wilson was non-committal. Mr. Ford said to the President, If he can't act, I will. During the first few days of the trip, Mr. Ford made himself available to the newsmen and also the peace activists. During one of his interviews with the newsmen, he said, I have $150 million that I will use if necessary to end this war. I want to stop this war, he said. The New York Tribune, in a headline, wrote, Great War Ends Christmas Day, Ford to Stop It. Having taken his gloves off with the President of the United States, Henry Ford turned his attention to the crowned and uncrowned heads of state in Europe. Not even Henry Ford was naive enough to suppose that identical Marconigrams sent to kings, kaisers, and presidents in themselves would change their hearts. His main objective in all of this was to get the peace talk started. An important part of his wireless assault was to send copies to all the important newspapers in Europe. The message Henry Ford was sending was, Must more lives be crushed out, more wives and mothers be reaved, 
before we recognize that Europe is bleeding to death. The plan of the neutral conference was outlined and the wire concluded with an appeal that the army stand still where they are so that the soldiers may deliver back from another bitter winter in the trenches and send back their laborers and their firesides. And there is no other way to end the war except mediation and discussion. Why waste one more precious human life for the sake of humanity? Respectfully yours, Henry Ford and 165 representatives of the people of the United States. At 5 a.m. on December 15th, the Oscar II slipped into a pier in Christian, Norway, now known as Oslo. Mr. Ford had assured the delegates that there would be a gala welcome for him in Norway. No Norwegians came until 9 a.m., and then a mere 12. As a peace cruise delegates disembarked, the Oscar II headed towards their hotel. They were surprised that the Norwegians had no interest in them. But Norway was walking a tightrope of neutrality. Norway itself had voted sums of money for preparedness. They also had universal conscription, and preparedness was a national slogan for them. Nevertheless, the peace delegates called a peace conference. They invited intellectuals and the press and talked about ways to end the First World War. The Norwegian press declared the conference useless, and the main reason was because its driving force, the person who captured the imagination of the Norwegians, Henry Ford, was absent. Mr. Ford was sick at the hotel in bed with the flu. The peace cruise continued on, on to Sweden, Denmark, and finally Germany. Mr. Ford, however, was too sick to continue on. He decided to sail back to the United States. Because of their stay in Germany, some people in the United States considered the peace cruise pro-German. Henry Ford's peace cruise can be summed up by the words of one prominent European when he said, what business did they have there in the first place? Our final section of tonight's report is the internet update. What's going on with Michigan's World War I Centennial on the web? Well, I wanted to let you know that there is a Facebook page up for Michigan's World War I Centennial, and also there is a LinkedIn group. So if you're on Facebook or if you're on LinkedIn, please join these groups and you'll be able to see what's going on as far as Michigan's World War I Centennial. Thank you for watching Michigan's World War I Centennial News Report. If you have questions or comments, please send an email to the email address displayed on the screen. And once again, thank you for watching Michigan's World War I Centennial News Report.